but the man was getting ready to go on an overseas trip with his family and something came up and he couldn't go so he sent his wife and two children on the ship this is before they had airplanes and all that stuff going around and and uh he was at home and uh he was getting ready to leave the next day to catch up with them and the uh, one of the um telegrams came in and said the ship that your wife and child was on had sunk and they both died and so he was over to he went over to claim their bodies and as he was leaning over the the balcony over the uh, railing rather he these words came to him and that's how he wrote that song it is well with my soul when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like bill sea billows roll like they just keep coming he says whatever my lot God has taught me to say it is well. It is well with my soul. So when you hear these songs, not the new ones, the new ones are, are different, but some of the old songs, they were written from genuine experiences that the people have gone through and, um, and have had experience. And so there's a lot of meaning and a lot of uh, real depth to them. Uh, so um, Praise God. Well, I was surprised this morning because, you know, I was, I was contemplating the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to really share. I had something prepared, but I, I really didn't feel a release of it. And all of a sudden, I saw these four young men sitting here, and I said, oh, that means that Pastor Jerome is in the house. And then uh, brother and sister Chen came. And so I asked him, I said, well, you know, I said, why don't you uh, share something with us? So we want to give a good God bless welcome to Brother and Sister Chin. Amen. God bless you. Come take your liberty this morning. I'm going to give it to you first. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. morning. Wow, well, still just basking in the presence of the Lord. You know, when the pastor said this morning to the, um, to the worship team, I know you don't feel like moving. I was like, yeah, we don't feel like moving. Just the stillness, just the presence of the Lord. This morning when um, Jerome and I woke up, we started talking about DNA, the makeup of people. And I'll tell you, I was so excited about it. And I said, hey, let's look at that a little more. So we went in, we said, hey, Siri, tell us about DNA. And so she brought up some articles about DNA, and we wrote to church, and we continued talking about DNA. And then you shared something about... Yeah. And the information that's in a DNA code, that it is... Um, there's so many specifics inside of the DNA code, and when God takes and writes that information, the book on your life, just your eye alone, the information, if it were written in a book, that book would go all the way from Earth to the moon and back again like 10 times. That's just for one part of me. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing story. And that, the code, the DNA code, is actually the instructions that are given for your life, for your body, for everything, for your development. That's inside of that code, the information in there. This is amazing. So it's so exciting. I mean, if you ever thought there was, a, you know, I wonder if anyone ever write a book about me. It's been done. God the Father wrote the book on all of our lives. The recipe is there. It's beyond imagination. When you don't think or feel like you're good enough, your Father's given the re recipe for you. You know, even before, what was so exciting, the part that was exciting to me was where uh, they talked about this recipe and this whole pattern for your life is actually already settled even before you reach the earth, before you are birthed, that DNA is there. And I said to him, wow, it all makes sense. That makes sense. The God of the universe who formed us before we were in our mother's womb, he knew all about it. The number of hairs that are on our head, all numbers. He's the God of numbers, the God that takes us from where we are beyond. So today when we aren't aware exactly of what's happening tomorrow. Just rest in the fact that the recipe is there. There's a pattern for your life beyond imagination. That got me so excited. And what excited me even more is how God just says, hey, you woke up this morning, hey, start talking about the DNA. I want, you, I want to just show you something. I want to take you to a place you haven't been before. Something I haven't noticed too much, you know, or, or given much thought of. But when God drops something on, you need to dig into it a little more and find out what he has for you. 
So I give God the glory and the praise today that 10 times to the moon and back, just in the, in the eye. Amazing. What a great God we serve. It's great to be with all of you today. Amen. Do you have a stand just for, for this that I can I can use? Yeah, sure. So, I love it. I I love it. You know, if I hadn't been chained, y'all might hear me all the way home. <laughs> um, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, I just want to set it down every now and then. That's actually trying to get a little fancy. His pockets are loaded. My briefcase. I'm wearing it. All right, amen. All right, well, good morning, everyone. I bless you. It's so good to be here this morning. I thank God. Thank you. Thank you, praise and worship team. Uh, ministers, amen, who ministered to us the gospel. And, and not just the message of the good news, but ministered to us the presence of God. You know, he says he inhabits the praises of his people. And God's presence was here in such an amazing way, and God was doing things inside of our lives, and uh, I know inside of mine, he was doing things, and they talk about chains coming off and things like that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's throughout life and throughout days, it's not just when you come to the altar at salvation that chains drop off there, it's through life, you can start to reaccumulate different types of chains in your life, things that are holding you back. And sometimes you come in bound up with just some chains or, 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 um, that, that are there through emotions or through a mindset. And you're coming in to worship the Lord and, and things are holding you back. There's, there's clouds of, 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 of thoughts, of doubts or, or, or guilt or shame or whatever it is, frustration that sometimes gets in the way. Sometimes so many conversations are going there that you can't even focus on the Lord. And when he starts to move and his presence starts to come in, see, that's the beautiful thing about, about corporate worship. You know, he starts to move. See, you're having a struggle praising. You're having a struggle getting through. But the praise over here and the praise over there his presence is coming in. His presence is coming in. And that's how we begin to minister to one another in hymns and in psalms and in the word and so forth. And so that word that's inside of it, that praise that's in it, it releases the presence of God. And it comes in and begins to break those chains and set you free. You know? Amen. You know, uh, times there are times that uh, uh, those of us who, who are called to, to preach and to teach, that we can come in and, and we can have some things, reserves or whatever, holding us back. And we need God. We need him just as much as the day that we first came to that altar. We need him just as desperately. And really, in my experience, I found that, you know, that was, that was maybe the greatest miracle. But I find myself needing him even more desperately because of the battle that began because of my decision at the altar that day. You know, all hell just wants to unleash on you. It wants to trip you up. It, it, it might say, hey, you know, you may go to heaven, but you're going to live a life of hell right now. All you've got to do is listen to me and trust me. You know, if I tripped up Adam and Eve and said, did God really say? I can trip you up too because it's been working since then. Amen? Amen? And so the thing is this. It's a very simple trick. You don't need to listen to them. 
So don't. You got the right to remain silent. <laughs> <laughs> don't say anything to him. Don't entertain him. That's it. Set your mind on things above. Right? Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of your faith. If he started it, he will finish it. Amen? If anything is lovely, is pure, is excellent, is praiseworthy, think on these things. Think on these things. Amen? It's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to see my brother from another mother. I'm telling you. And it's crazy. We go places and eat together, and people say we look alike. You know, I tip the waitress good and tell her to say I'm the good looking one. <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to be uh, uh, speaking about, um, about Christian life and about choices and about choosing your life. God said, I set before you a choice of life and of death, of blessing and of curse. And what lays before us is this choice. But God, he helps us out because sheep are not really all that smart. And, 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 and I'm not the smartest one in the bunch, you know? But I know the shepherd is. And he says, choose life. Choose blessing. So I can trust him. I really don't put a whole lot of uh, faith in my own self figuring something out apart from God. But when I have to make choices and decisions or there are, are complex things or complicated things that need figuring out, then I go to the source where it's infallible, where the answers are there. And I've learned to begin to, to meditate on the word, to pray, and to trust in the Lord, and to wait on him, not meaning I'm immobile, not meaning I'm not doing anything, but to continue serving in the capacity that I know what to do until the answer comes through. And then there is the manifestation of the blessing. And, and that blessing is much more than the answer I've been waiting for. But it's the work of the Lord that begins to take and to change me and to transform me, to change my heart, to change my mind, to change the way I see things. You know, in obedience, so much more happens. You know, and so obedience is so much better than sacrifice. Um, the truth of the matter is obedience, in a, in, a, in a true sense, is really not sacrifice. It's making the best choice so that you don't sacrifice the good things in life that God has for you. You don't sacrifice the relationship. You don't sacrifice the intimacy. You don't fa sacrifice the, the nearness and the closeness of hearing him and the peace that surpasses all understanding, that guards your heart and mind. You don't sacrifice the joy, unspeakable joy in the midst of it. You don't sacrifice those things. It was because of the trust in the Lord that songs like this come out that says, when sea billows roll, Man, you know, but whatever my lot, you taught me something. And you taught me to say it's well, it's well with my soul, you know. And, and, and these are in, 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 in tragedies, heavy trials, heavy situations to, to lose your whole family. And, 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 and not even be able to maybe have a service and go in and view them one last time to say goodbye. But whatever my lot, you taught me to say, it's well. 
it is well with my soul. Amen. Out of some of the hardest places and rockiest places of life come the most beautiful songs. Out of some of the rockiest places and, and on earth come the most beautiful wildflowers. Amen. So let's open up our Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I am feeling so blessed, and I'm not saying just saying this. I mean, I am feeling, not only feeling, I am so blessed to be here. It is such a blessing um, to be here. Uh, and to see you, my brother, and to be here with, with all of you uh, and, and to worship with you. Amen. I'm going to be looking at this thing that where there's a, a question I'm going to put out there and to pose, and that question is something that I want you to think about throughout this time as uh, we begin to share um, this lesson, okay? And it's, um, what kind of Christian are you? If someone were to look at my life or or, or to look at your life, well, what kind of Christian would they see? If, if God were to take a photograph of, say, the carnal Christian, would you be in that photograph? Would you be in that? Or would you be in the portrait of the spiritual Christian family? I'm going to share about two kinds of Christians. There are two types of Christians. There's three types of people. Okay, there's an unregenerated person that's, un that's not saved. And then there's the person who's regenerated, who is saved, who's been born again. Okay, and in there of that person that's saved, okay, because I'm leaving out the unregenerated person, and I'm going to talk about the two, one salvation has come and, and into life and, and become a part of, of our lives, that there's the carnal Christian, and then there's the spiritual Christian. And so I, I'd like to talk about these two Christians. And so they're both, they're clearly named in Scripture. Um, the Apostle Paul actually um, uh, uh, speaks about it um, quite a bit in the Corinthian church. And so one thing that's so important about this is that we need to know what kind of Christian we are, and then we need to take and make a determination as to which one we want to be. Remember that there's a choice, and, and, and there's nothing, no one in the way of your choice. Satan's not, not he's not all powerful. You've got the Spirit of God in you. If you've made a choice for Christ, You've got the Spirit of God in you, and that's om omnipotence, okay? And so he can't stop you unless you let him, okay? You have to allow him, all right? And so you have a choice, and you can choose which one you want to be. You can choose blessing, and blessing is yours. You make a choice. God didn't put it in front to tease us. Nope. We get that from the other side, all right? And so we want to make a choice as to which one I want to be, okay? And so Paul speaks to us, he speaks to Christians as, as carnal and as spiritual. And which kind of Christian are you, okay? The marks of a carnal Christian's life are this. Number one, it's a life of unceasing conflict, okay? Unceasing conflict. If I choose to be a carnal Christian, I'm going to have unceasing conflict in my life. But along with that unceasing conflict, there's another mark that also takes place in my life, and that's repeated defeat. If I'm carnal, I'm going to always experience defeat. 
I'm going to, to, to feel defeated. I'm going to wonder, well, why did I make this choice? Why am I in this lifestyle? Why did I do this? Look what God's doing to me. Because I'm going to be defeated. I'm going to be in darkness. I'm going to be in confusion because of this carnal nature in which I'm embracing. Okay? And the next thing about that is that there's this thing that's called protracted infancy. That means extended. It means it, it, it's like to be held back. Okay? You know, when we use the word, we say, like, retarded, okay? And that word, as far as politically correct, we begin to take and want to remove that word out of our language, but that word is there for a purpose. And when words are used right, they're fine, okay? And so what retarded means is to be held back, okay? And so someone could be mentally retarded. They're held back mentally and they can't proceed forward as they would had their life been normal in a mental sense. If they're retarded physically, then their body doesn't develop physically in the way that it would normally develop had that not been there. Okay, so protracted is really just the same word. And so we can say extended infancy. That means that I stay in an infantile state for an extended period of time beyond what is natural, beyond what is normal. You know, Watchman Nee, he, he wrote a book called The Normal Christian. The normal Christian is totally abnormal when standing next to someone of the world. Okay, you're peculiar, you're strange, you're different. But you realize that you are just traveling through. You're just passing through. That's it. You're a pilgrim, and you're here for a reason, and that's to represent the kingdom of heaven. You got a king, and you got a kingdom that you belong to, and it's the kingdom of light. It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of heaven. You know, when my wife was sharing about the DNA, about this here book that is written about you before you even become to be. God said, I knew you before the foundations of the world. Why? Because I already designed you. I already wrote the book on you. I wrote everything. I knew you. While you were yet in your mother's womb, I came there and I began to put you together by that blueprint of your DNA structure that I wrote for you. Amen? I tell you, he, he's such a big God, but he sure enough got such a tiny pen that he could write all of that stuff and fit it inside the nucleus of a cell. Wow. Isn't that crazy? You know? Man, I got to carry around all these big old books. My, oh, my. I'm telling you, I'm going to ask him when I get there. I'm going to ask him, how'd you do that? <laughs> God, how'd you do that? Yeah. Okay, and so uh, let's, let's, look at, let's look at this here, okay, in 1 Corinthians. I think I want to find. Aha, these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and... Uh, I'm going to read from verse uh, 1 to 4, okay? And I'm reading out of the NASB, all right? And it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able... For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? As we begin to take and to read this letter, it seems as though Paul is writing a letter and he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to take and to speak to the Corinthian church, this body of believers. And he's inspired 
to take and to deal with them in their matters and how they've interpreted worship, how they have interpreted their Christian lifestyle, and to explain to them some things that are holding back the blessings that God has designed to come in to our community. God has, has taken and, 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 and given us that, that we would share in this blessing. And some people were not sharing in it because of what, how they chose to worship. There was arguing in there. There was disunity in there. There was division in there. There was, they weren't sharing with one another freely as God would have them to share. So they saw, we saw greed in there. But they, 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 experienced, they experienced some great things, you know. They, they, had to, they had gifts that were going in there. But while they had gifts, the greatest gifts of all, they were denying themselves. They had the gift of knowledge, you know. They had the gift of healing flowing in there. They had gifts like wisdom and everything that was happening in there, but they weren't doing things too, in a, such a wise way. You know? And so Paul begins to speak to them, and he's telling them about their carnality. You know, I, I think in some of these things, you know, we go back to some foundational verses of Scripture, you know, where God is, says some things like, you know, Jesus is talking to the people, and, and he tells us about what's the greatest laws, the greatest things. And he talks about to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and I think that that really wasn't in there. That love wasn't in there, you know? Um, and so here we see this thing that's happening. He says, he talks about the carnality that's in there. I can't speak to you as to, car, as, as to spiritual, but as to carnal. Now, let's go to, to, to Romans, okay, chapter 7 for a minute. And share. Okay, and so remember, this is a life, we're going to talk about this, this here conflict that's happening. It just doesn't seem to stop. I, I go from one battle to the next battle. Every day I seem to wake up on the wrong side of the bed, no matter what side of, what side of the room I put it on, you know. You might know some people like that. <laughs> okay, Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, it says, For I joyfully concur, concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, now let's go to Galatians 5.17. And it says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Okay. And so what is happening here is that the apostle Paul begins to take and to, to speak about this life in, in its carnal nature, and he says that we've got these laws that are in there. And he says there's two diverse laws, two diverse laws or principles in which we're living by, and he says they're at war against one another in the same personality. Like, kind of like a split personality, it sounds like to me. <laughs> um, you know? And so it's two forces that are there. Two forces, but they're absolutely contrary to one another. And each one is in a battle for control. Anybody know what that feels like? Hmm? Okay, cool. I'm in the right place. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> and I'm not alone. All right? And so 
with these two laws, these two mindsets that are in battle, and, and, and there's a war going on inside the personality of the person, okay? There's, this is the language of a conflict. It's the language that's happening of warfare. There's two natures. There's the divine nature, and there's the fleshly nature, and it's engaged in a deadly war within the Christian. Now, Remember, you've got a choice. Blessing or curse. Life or death. Now each one has a voice and speaks to you. Now each one that has a voice and that speaks to you and speaks to me wants me to also repeat the messages that it gives. If it's contrary to the word of God, listen, men wake up in the morning and I have them take and make a proclamation. If it's just reading off a piece of paper and they're not making it a part of their heart and a part of their life, then they will just read words off a piece of paper and they will be like a parrot, but they will never experience the life that is inside those words. And they say every morning, this is the day that the Lord has made. And then it is a choice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It is something that will straighten out every single mind is that Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives by faith in me. And his word, it dwells in me richly. And I'm blessed. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm set free. And sickness can't dwell in me because the number of my days he will fulfill. Sin can't dominate me because Jesus Christ is my Lord and I am in him. And they go on with this thing that tells them to proclaim it into the atmosphere but to get it in their heart. The word is a seed. You can have a pocket full of seed, but it'd be hard to fit the harvest in your pocket. I am more than a conqueror because of his love. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as the redeemed of the Lord, I say so. What's that mean? Is that I have a choice and that I have a message. And that I need to live that message is that I say so. And my word in my life needs to say so. You see this here life. We've got this war going on that's battling inside. And each side, each one is contesting for control. And uh, sometimes there's this spiritual nature that ascends to the top. And as a believer, I'm enjoying this momentary joy and this peace and rest. But more often, it's the fleshly nature that's in control of the carnal Christian. And there's little enjoyment of spiritual blessing. I'm experiencing temptation. I'm tempted. I'm tempted to do wrong. I know it's wrong. And I'm tempted to do it. And I yield to it. And then my conscience begins to speak to me because the Spirit of God works through my conscience and he designed me to put a conscience in there, kind of to help me out, you know. But the conscience begins to say, why'd you do it? And it reminds me of the little boy who kept running away from home, and 
He's running away and running away, and his parents are trying to do everything, you know? And one day, they put him on punishment and tell him to go up to your room and stay in your room. They put him up there. They're going to put him up there for a couple of hours. Little Johnny needs to stay in his room. And uh, dad goes up there and doesn't see little Johnny. He comes down to mom and says, little Johnny's not in the room. You see him? Where is he at? Little Johnny's not there. Mom and dad both go rushing up to the room and look, only to see the window open. And little Johnny had uh, climbed out the window, and he's gone again. He's run away again. And they ride all over the neighborhood and knock on friends' doors, and they can't find little Johnny anywhere. They report to the police, little Johnny's gone. And later on that night, there's a knock on the door. And Mom answers the door, and there's an officer standing there with little Johnny. And he says, we found your son. And mom at this time has fallen to pieces. Dad already fell to pieces, but we hold it together on the outside pretty good. And she says, Johnny, Johnny, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to me? And he says, Mom, you know, he says, I got Satan pulling on one leg, and I got Jesus pulling on the other. And he said, but Satan's pulling harder. My question is, who's pulling your leg harder? Who's got a hold of you, and who's pulling your leg harder? Habitually yielding to the devil and giving him control over your life, this is the life of the wretched Christian. This is the one that we see in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, and it says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Is your life a life of unceasing conflict? Number two, it's the life of repeated defeat. In Romans 7, 19, we have, For the good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want to do. The good I want to do, I, I, I don't do it. What I practice is the evil that I, I, I don't want to do. Life. Repeated defeat. It's a life of repeated defeat. I want to do good, but I don't. When I want to do good, I'm practicing evil. I'm practicing what's wrong. Could this not be your life or my life? It's the revelation of a true desire and an honest attempt to live a holy life, but overcome with the atmosphere of deadly defeat. Defeat so overpowering as to burst forth that cry of deliverance, who will deliver me from this body of death? And, 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 and who, which one of us has not yet uttered it in some way, shape, or form? God, help me. Help me. Help me to do what's right. Help me to make the right choice. Help me not to do that again. God, help me. Countless resolutions, promises, but hearts that are heavy with the humiliation and a sense of failure. You get sins of commission and omission and they're robbing us of our sleep and losing our tempers and full of pride. We've got as much selfishness this year as it had last year. And what about worry? And neglecting to study the Bible and to read the Word and to pray. And we've got no more concern about souls that are lost today than we had yesterday. 
And the trouble is not with the will. It's very sincere in the decisions made, and it fully purposes to carry those decisions out. But there's divided control over the carnal Christian's life. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not, Romans 7, uh, 7 18. There's divided control over the carnal Christian's life, and that always spells defeat. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He shouldn't expect to get anything from God. We've got to make a choice. You know, some, you know, you know, I understand the grace of God and the love of God and all of those different things, but what I see sometimes is that we begin to look at one aspect of God and, the, and his goodness, and we don't look at all of the other aspects because they call us out of our comfort zone. Come and follow me. If any man desires to come after me, he has to take up his cross daily, denying himself, and follow me. And many times we begin to look at these different types of messages which are there to help us, but sometimes can be misleading because they don't take and they don't spill out the entire whole gospel. They don't, they, they don't, they don't call us to what choices and what types of decisions that we make. And therefore, we take or we hear a full gospel, but we reject or we, we blind out, black out part of it and, and, and what we like we take in. And so we have this grace. And, and what we do is we hear about grace, which is so wonderful, but in our minds we take it through our filters and we pervert the grace of God. Shall we go on sinning that grace shall abound? Absolutely not. And so we are called to something. And, and, and that means that, see, the problem is with the practice. The problem is that I'm not adding on to. The problem is that they're staying in a state, not because God has forsaken them or neglected them as his children. He can't do that. It's impossible for him to do that. Why? Because he can't go against his own nature. And so he's going to have us to develop as his children fully into the man and woman that he called us to be. And the only way that we won't is by free choice or ignorance. But he'll have us not be ignorant <laughs> of Satan's devices. He'll have us not be ignorant of anything. He'll let us know what we need to know because he has called us to be kings and priests, ambassadors of Christ, representatives of the kingdom of heaven to this dark world. Okay, let me move in. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we talked about the divided control over the carnal Christian's life, and it always spells defeat, but he can have a deliverance if he will, but it's got to be a deliverance out of Romans 7 into Romans 8. Now, that's your homework. You've got to read that. <laughs> it's such, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that deliverance? Is that yours? Do you own it? Okay. And, and then the other, the third thing about the carnal Christian's life is it's prolonged or extended infancy. The, the, the carnal Christian, he never grows up. He remains a mere baby, a babe in Christ. The carnal Christians, okay, the Corinthian Christians, I'm sorry, should have been fully grown up. They should have been strong. They should have been meat-eating grown-ups. And instead, they were immature, they were weak, they were fragile, they were milk-dribbling infants. 
and they didn't measure up in stature or strength to what they should have been. There's a time to be a baby, and it's a wonderful time when we have babies and everything else. But what a heartbreak it is to be a parent whose baby stays in the state of a baby for 20-something years, 30-something years. That would be then heartbreak. Yes, you love them. You don't love any less, but it's a heartbreak. You realize how much, how, how many things they won't experience in life. There's a possibility, not marriage and not family, the first job, going to college, all of these different things that you experience in life that would be removed from them. And the same thing in our spiritual walk that we miss out when we remain a babe in Christ. I, I think about the pain. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a nurse, and so I work long-term pediatrics for quite some time. And so I've seen many, I, I take care of babies that, that never develop. I take care of people who are in their 30s and only this big, and they still have a diaper, they have a feeding tube, and, and, and I change them and I roll them. They look just like babies except they may have hair under their arms or in, in, in other areas, you know. But they, they can't talk. They can't do anything. And I, I, I don't, you know, though I see the love that is there, I see such a sadness that's there, a hurt that's there. I see that it also in, 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 that, in this field, and if, you know, those of you who are nurses will understand me, um, that many of them, um, they're sick all the time. They catch so many infections, and you constantly have to do so many things because of not developing, so immune systems don't develop well, and they become uh, very vulnerable to, to just being sick. And so what will happen is you get sick, too. And you get sick, 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 and eventually your immune system kicks in, and when other people would get sick, you don't get sick anymore. And you are now able to take care of them, but you are able to share in some of the suffering that's there. You get to see the parents heartbroken. You see some of them, uh, 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 they may grow up into the size of an adult, but they don't have the ability to walk. They don't have the uh, strength to do certain things because they stayed in a protracted state where they were held back in their physical development. They may have a few sentences like, I love you. And that's nice and it brings joy, but how sad it is because of all of the other sentences, all of the other aspects of life that they'll never have. And they have to have people who are waiting on them all the time, who wake them up, who sit them up, who have to change them, who have to wash them up, who have to get them in a chair and roll them to activities and have them to take and do physical therapy and then all sorts of things that are made for them to even be able to communicate. A very sad thing. I see, and many reasons why people can be in that state, but I see in the parent's eyes. You know when you look in someone's eyes and you see the light of life? You look at a smile, but you see crying. I see a sadness many times. And then I see where it hurts so bad that loving parents no longer come every day. Sometimes we see them twice a year on major holidays, maybe a birthday. And we become their family because it hurts so bad, not because they don't love them. It hurts. And I, 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 I often I wonder about the hurt and the heartbreak, you know? And I, I thank God that I don't have to experience that myself. But I, I, I can't help but feel it, too, but feel the pain, too. And then I wonder about the heartbreak of God when we, as his children, refuse. Because 
We don't grow up because we're stuck. Like them, they didn't have any sense of choice there. But when we as his children refuse to grow up, and he sees us there, and we suffer as a result of that, I encourage you to grow up. Amen? You know, the marks of a baby is that it helplessly dependent on others absorbs attention and expects to be the center of his own little world. He lives in the realm of his feelings. And if all goes well, he's pleased and he's smiling, but he's exceedingly touchy, you know. And if his desire is crossed at any point, he'll let it be known in a self-centered demonstration. Now, that's all right for a baby. <laughs> but the carnal Christian bears the same marks, you know? I'm sure as a pastor, you've been at the end of it. <laughs> you didn't do enough. You weren't there. It's because of you, something you said. The sermon you preached is because somebody told you about me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's the marks of, of the carnal Christian. I, I, I don't choose to be the, the to be a carnal Christian. I want to be a spiritual Christian. I'm not a Toys R Us kid. I, I want to grow up. <laughs> All right. I want to grow up. I don't mind the toys though. Okay. So anybody looking at Spider Man, get me one. Okay. Let's go to John chapter 14, and let's talk about another Christian. Let's talk about you, the marks of a spiritual Christian. When you see the carnal Christian, I want you to encourage them. I want you to love them. And I want you to be an encouragement and show them how wonderful it is to be a spiritual Christian, that it affects their life, and they get what you're getting. John chapter 14 Verse 27, Jesus is speaking with his disciples before leaving, and he, he wants to give them something. And so he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, or your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Okay? Peace, it's peace, he's, 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 he's blessing them, he's giving them peace. And he said, I, I don't give it like the world gives it. When I give you something, you really get it. All right. And so I'm giving you this peace, and it's yours. It's an abiding peace is what he's given, not a temporal peace that's here today and gone tomorrow. It's a peace, and it's a peace that's so powerful that it goes beyond what I can comprehend. I can't understand this peace. That's the, the song. See, it was the peace. Okay? And, and why the beautiful song in, in a time where it's so hard? It's the peace I give you. And, and, and I don't give it like the world gives it. And so don't let your heart be troubled. Okay? And so as you begin to follow me through the message, you're going to see some things. You're going to see that the life of the spiritual Christian is a strong contrast to that of the carnal Christian. As the carnal Christian's life is one, and it's unceasing conflict. Number two, it's repeated defeat. And number three, it's extended infancy. But the, 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 the spiritual Christian, his life is, it's a life of abiding peace. It's a life of habitual victory. And it's a life of constant growth into Christ's likeness. And so let's look at this thing. It's a, a life of abiding increase. And so in the a, in a, in a spiritual Christian's life, there's still conflict in, in our lives. But 
growth comes through victory in conflict. There is peace through the consciousness of victory in Christ. We have a conscious victory that is all-inclusive in Christ Jesus. And so the spiritual Christian doesn't continue in the practice of known and willful sin, and he lives in this place. It's the unclouded sunshine of Christ's presence. You know, during that time of worship, that some of us was experiencing something, and there was when all the clouds, all of the things, that as you're going through the monotony of the week, as you're going through the things maybe on the job, as you're going through the things maybe in school or, or shopping in the store, that your mind is on something else, and you're not experiencing what you was experiencing while the praise and worship began to take and to bring you in and put your mind on him, to focus on him. And you begin to focus on him, and you begin to stop thinking about other things, and this thought dropped off, and that thought dropped off, and that thought dropped off, and the attention that was here went there, and the attention that was there went there, and the attention that was there went there, and clouds began to move, and the sunshine of Christ began to shine in. And pretty soon, not only did Christ come, but Christ began to take you away. You began to get taken away. You get lost in his presence. And you started to hear things. You heard people, da 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 ka da 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 And they began speaking in other tongues and worshiping in ways because just in their natural way, they couldn't worship. They couldn't take and speak. They couldn't say the things that, that they were experiencing. And it began to be a language that our language takes in and hinders us, it limits us. And, and, and we begin to take and speak this heavenly language where there's freedom, even the chains of just my natural life drop off and another language comes in where I could worship God. What's worship? It's about his worthiness, that he's worthy. It's not about what I'm going through. It's not about what I'm facing. It's that he's worthy, that he's worthy of glory. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of my adoration. He's worthy of my blessing. He's worthy of my commitment. He's worthy of my dedication. He's worthy of exaltation. He's not just worthy of my best, but he's worthy of my all. Christ is worthy. Amen. And so we experience the conflict. But we have victory in it, not defeat. And we have a peace because of the consciousness of our victory in Christ. And the spiritual Christian doesn't continue to practice known full sin. Oh, nothing will get in the way of his intimacy with Christ. And so he's living in this place that's not clouded with the doubt, not clouded with shame, not clouded with fear, but he's free. And his communion with God is, is not haunted with this consciousness of soiled hands. You know, you, you ever begin to go in and God's presence becomes starts coming in really full, and all of a sudden it comes so powerful that you begin to go, whoa, I better stop. Because what comes in your conscience begins to take and to tell you about something, and it's about your hands being soiled. And then you're like, whoa, 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 for a minute. And the conviction comes in. And God doesn't want you to stop there. He wants you to continue to come close, but he wants you to confess your sin and to repent of your sin. You don't trample his court. We don't want to soil his court. We don't want to trample in there with any old dirty, nasty attitude. But we confess him and we turn that attitude around and, and, and the blood of Christ washes us clean. And the door, the door, the door is open. We open the door. He opened the door. John, come on in. It's no, you, you know, you don't have that condemning heart. 
but you enjoy the abiding peace and this deep, deep joy and a satisfying rest in the Lord. That's the spiritual Christian life. Is that life your life? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, I'm almost, almost, almost done, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. All right, Romans 8, 37. Okay, that's a verse that we all know. And it says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. Okay? In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. God so loved the world. It's a life of habitual victory. And it doesn't say victories. It says victory. Because the victory of the resurrection is an all-inclusive one. Everything that you're going through Resurrection has taken care. Nobody else got up from the grave but Jesus Christ alone. And the victory over sin, see, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. The victory over sin is a gift through Christ, and it's ours to claim it. You know, if he had just said that we were just conquerors, it would have been enough. But he says, but, you know, Paul is, is just like I said, they got to declare in the morning. They got a declaration. They got to proclaim a thing. Paul is declaring something, and he's declaring it. And he said, we are more than conquerors through Christ. More. And if he had just said that we are conquerors, it would have been enough. But he's declaring by the Spirit of God that we're more than conquerors, and that's victory with a plus sign. It means that you got enough. Plus, you got something left over. You ain't totally empty the tank. <laughs> Second Corinthians 2.14. This is going to be the conclusion. Coming up, 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, But thanks be the God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. I want you to take note of this word, always. Okay? The victory, it's not limited to certain times or places or circumstances. We always can have this battle that goes on inside of our life where we face things and we figure in this area we're having victory, in this area we're not, we're defeated. But the victory in Christ is all-inclusive in everything that you face. You are more than a conqueror. He always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ Jesus. Always. And so God said that he causes us to always triumph in Christ. Now you might say, Jerome, that's all right for you to stand there and to preach that such a victory is possible. But you don't know my situation. You don't know my circumstance. You don't know what I've been through. And I can tell you you're absolutely right. I don't know. I don't know your circumstance. I didn't walk in your shoes. I don't know what you've been through. 
But God does. And he put it there. He's the one who said always. And all you have to do is accept it and believe it. Believe that God can always lead you and triumphal procession in Christ. God, you can always do that because you said so. I know you can. That's it. And it doesn't mean that the possessor of this victory is not able to sin. But he is also able to not sin. See, continuous sinning is not going to be the practice of his life. And what that means is that though a righteous man falls several times, he gets up again. And, and, and when you get up and you repent of a thing, it's like about face of that thing. And I walk away and go towards Christ. And if I face something else that's going to take and, and begin to take and it, it's, getting, it's getting victory on me or, or it seems to be winning the battle, and then I need to repent and turn from that thing and walk away to, to, towards Christ. All right? And so, real victory, it takes, it takes place. It makes a change in the innermost recesses of the spirit. Okay? It's victory on the inside. And then it's lived out on the outside. Every area. Every area. It don't matter. Okay, and so it'll take and it'll make a change. It'll make a transformation in your innermost recesses of your spirit, and that'll transform your inner disposition. My inner disposition gets transformed, and uh, my attitude it changes as well. And then my outward deeds and my outward acts do the same. I want you to take and think for a minute and just take this test, right? Now, you lose your temper and you blow up, right? But now there's, there's, there's outward control, okay? Yesterday you blow up. You're losing your temper. But now you got outward control. But inside you harbor and you hold secret resentments. Now understand what I said. That you hold it. You harbor it. And you hold secret resentments. And I want to ask you a question. Is this real victory? It's not victory. But I want you to know that God wants us changed on the innermost recesses of our heart. And in doing so, victory, in a sense, God has made kind of simple to me. It can, you know, we can make it complex. But he's, this gospel is a simple thing. Even the Bibles are written on about a seventh, you know, seventh grade you know, educational level and so forth. So, um, and, and those are actually some of the more difficult ones in seventh grade. All right, and, and so he, he's, his gospel is for a child to understand it. And, and so this good news, this walk, is so that we can understand it. It's so wonderful to us. And so my victory is in this one word to God, and that's yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Amen? Amen. All right, well, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed, okay? And Jesus Christ set us free from the power of sin and death. And to make that victory permanent, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell and to control us, okay? And so the carnal man is under the power of the law of sin and death, and it operates in his life, bringing him under dominion. But the believer has another law at work, and it's a higher power. It's a higher law. It's a higher principle. 
And as he yields himself to its mighty power, the spiritual man's delivered from the law of sin and death. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Is it a life? Continual victory? It's a life of constant growth in the Christ likeness. And along with growing, with the growing knowledge of Jesus Christ and a deepening communion with Him, there's got to be a growing likeness to Him. In and of ourselves, we are really not too attractive on the inside. We look about as good as a polluted river. Okay? But when our whole being turns Christward and our lives lie open to him, every area of our lives, okay, to see his glory. And his glory takes in, it shines in, because our lives are open to it, and it shines in. And then we'll be so transformed into his image that others looking at us won't see us. You know when you look at that window, you look out there, all of the prints and fingerprints that might be on the window, the smudges, imperfections that are on the glass, you don't recognize them while you're looking out there at the beautiful day. And all the prints and smudges and imperfections that are in our life, people don't see that, but they see the beauty of Christ that's beyond that. We're reflecting the glory of the Lord. And if that's what you want, I want you to take a stand, and I want you to stand up, and I want you to begin to speak to God in your own language and begin to openly confess his goodness and tell him what you are. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just feel in my spirit to sing that song again. Can I have the worship team that was up here come out and come, out, come back up? If you're in a hurry and you want to go, you can go. But I'll tell you, God really moves at times. When... So we want to say goodbye to Facebook. God bless you. Glad that you were with us and hope that message really touched your heart this morning. It did mine.